Okay. Well, I'm here to tell you about how we can design um, computer vision models using um, a, a lot of the knowledge base like representations that Esan was talking about earlier, uh, specifically ones that are derived from scene graphs. So to begin with, although computer vision has really got, uh, gotten really good at recognizing and identifying objects, our world is more than just a collection of these objects. Uh, it's rich and it's vibrant and people constantly surprise us with uh, new performances. Uh, they repurpose items for new use cases. They find themselves in predicaments they never thought they would. Uh, we see them using equipment we've never seen and in ways that we haven't even imagined. And even animals surprise us with their fashion sense or by their unexpected agency. Now, these new situations are commonplace and we can interpret these sort of new compositions with quite relative ease by sort of reconstructing them from these individual components that we do recognize and have seen before. Um, now, unfortunately, despite a decade of amazing advancements, most of the deep learning models that are powering the vision technologies today, they truly struggle to understand this visual world. Um, the, these visual models, they struggle because they are unable to generalize when they see novel compositions of previously seen concepts. For example, even if they've seen examples of fire hydrants and people, these models learn to cheat and they end up ignoring entire regions of the image. They end up predicting that the person is sitting on a chair instead of uh, sitting on a fire hydrant. Uh, and the reason they make these mistakes is because they inherit biases in the data, because most instances of people sitting are usually sitting on a chair. Um, and in fact, uh, even the, the latest sort of 12 billion parameter models that were released by OpenAI earlier this year, uh, these ones that trained on 400 million training images uh, these models also still fail to generalize these novel compositions. So it suggests that these problems of being able to generalize the novel compositions, this might be a representational problem and not just a data problem. Now, in contrast, we know that human cognition can construct an infinite number of representations uh, from just a finite set of previously seen concepts. Uh, people are inductively uh, developing this sort of compositional model of the world and using their past experience um, they can appreciate new situations and new uh, scenes by learning things really quickly because they can understand that they're made off of these smaller components that they have seen. So enabling this kind of human-like visual intelligence is quite a challenging problem, and it will require us to really fundamentally modify computer vision's predominant reliance on just using object representations for most tasks. So inspired by human learning, I'm going to tell you about how we can design um, <clears throat> some of my research goals, which is around developing visual intelligence or computer vision models using ideas that are inspired by human cognition. So my main goal has been to move AI agents outside of their training data to allow them to sort of generalize these novel compositions. So in today's goal, uh, in today's talk, I'll explore some of these, uh, some of these goals and how we can design models that can generalize two novel compositions. I'll draw on Biederman's scene perception model and Jeremy Wolf's model of visual memory and cognitive science to design a new visual representation. And with this new representation, uh, we'll show that we can now build models that can learn from an, a finite set of situations that are outlined in their training data and allow them to uh, generalize to new situations that are a composition of these previously individually read concepts. Okay, so I'll first introduce scene graphs, uh, which uh, as Esan already mentioned, most of you might already know, uh, scene graphs are dense compositional general purpose visual representation. And then using scene graphs, I'll design models that are better at recognizing novel compositions. Uh, next, I'll use scene graphs to enable learning downstream computer vision tasks with as few as five training examples. And then finally, we'll explore uh, how to use scene graphs to generate a new benchmark for testing spatiotemporal compositional understanding. Okay, so let's get started. So the predominant paradigm today for training a lot of computer vision models is pre-training latent representations on large amounts of web scale data, and then uh, transferring that information to, uh, using um, uh, to any sort of downstream tasks like captioning. Uh, unfortunately, these sort of latent or object representations that are learned in this pre-straining stage, they often end up struggling to generalize to these downstream tasks. And the reason they struggle, as I've already mentioned, is because they learn shortcuts, uh, they end up ignoring parts of the image that they don't really need for the original task, 
uh, just to maximize performance on whatever data set they were pre-trained on. Uh, and because these learned representations end up ignoring parts of the region, they are sort of in some sense incomplete. And because they're incomplete, these downstream models uh, need a lot more data uh, to achieve any sort of reasonable performance. So our main insight is um, that we need a new representation, one that can understand and focus on all the individual parts of the image and not just the objects. Um, we're we're going to call this representation scene graphs, and I'll show that pre-training models on scene graphs will help models generalize to novel compositions, like a person sitting on a fire. And because this representation captures more information in a compositional manner, uh, these downstream models will need much fewer training examples uh, to be able to learn effectively. So I'm going to start by first motivating how we designed the scene graph representation. So let me contextualize why object representations, which are the most common form of pre-training, is insufficient for a variety of downstream tests. Um, and let's do that by looking at these two images. Now, if I take the pixels away, these object features um, that you might get from a model would tell you that these two images contain two people and you know where they are. And this might lead you to believe that these two images contain very similarly semantic uh, information. Uh, but knowing just the object information is often not enough because sometimes these two images with the same object representations uh, can have very different interpretations. Uh, for example, in the first image, one person is angry and yelling at another person, and in the second image, a person is paying attention to someone. So when we use object representations for downstream tasks, it's really no wonder that these models have such a hard time generalizing and why they need so much more data. Uh, and that leads us to a follow-up question, what is a good visual representation? Now, we know that human vision is adept at generalizing to novel compositions. So in an effort to establish a representation for visual intelligence, we turn to computational neuroscience and psychology, hoping to find inspiration for how people process visual stimuli. Now, back in the 80s, Irving Biederman, and again later in the 90s, Jeremy Wolf, they were also exploring this very question, very, very same question. Now, Biederman concluded that aside from categorizing objects and scene, people are also simultaneously processing attributes, which are properties of an object, as well as relationships between these objects. Now, attribute violations, like the person in the first image being transparent, or relationship violations, like the fire hydrant being on top of the mailbox, these kinds of violations, they slow down uh, our ability or people's ability to categorize objects. Now, a similar set of experiments in human memory uh, from Jeremy Wolf, it also concluded something very similar. He also concluded that objects are insufficient to explain uh, the human visual representation. He did a bunch of tests where he got people to memorize particular images and realized that by analyzing the errors that people must be encoding the relationships or interactions between objects as well as identifying uh, the objects. So noticing this grounding in human cognition across multiple studies, across multiple decades, uh, we designed a new representation called the scene graph representation. Um, and this scene graph representation encodes every single image uh, with a set of objects, which are grounded uh, as bounding boxes. Uh, it also contains attributes, which are associated with every single object. And then finally, relationships that encode the interactions between these objects. Now, this is just a small graph from uh, for this particular scene. Uh, and to really study the effects of scene graphs and its utility, uh, we embarked on a project called the Visual Genome Project, which aimed to map out the whole visual world with scene graphs. And here's a real scene graph from that Visual Genome Project. Uh, we annotated a large data set of scene graphs uh, to really study when and how it's useful. Now, with scene graphs designed and a data set collected, uh, we began training models to try to predict these scene graphs. And we were pretty excited when we found evidence that scene graphs are, in fact, better at generalizing to novel compositions. However, uh, training these models to predict scene graphs was quite a difficult uh, technical challenge. So let's, let's go into that a little bit. Now, formally, we can train scene graph models um, to expect an image as input and generate a scene graph with objects detected in the image with attributes associated with every single object and relationships between pairs of objects as the output. 
Now, for the rest of the talk, I'll ignore attributes because they can be modeled very similarly uh, to objects. Instead, I'll just focus on the structure of prediction tasks between objects and relationships. So here, we want to be able to detect the person, the hat, the field, the horse, uh, as the objects in the image. And we also want to be able to classify the relationships between them, like the person, uh, the one between the person and the horse as a standing on relationship. Now, what makes scene graph prediction so difficult is this long tail distribution of relationships that can occur between even just a single pair of objects. Uh, there are dozens of ways in which a person could be interacting with a horse. For example, some interactions like riding are just a lot more common than others. And it's much rarer to see people standing on horses. So treating each combination of these two objects and the relationship as a separate category, uh, well, it results in this quadratic increase in the number of possible outputs you might want your model to be able to generate. So more precisely, if we had n objects and k relationships types, we need to build n squared times k number of categories. And because most of these combinations only have a few examples, these models end up predicting the most common combination, which is a person riding a horse. So to prevent this kind of overfitting, uh, we decompose the problem, where instead of predicting the objects and the relationships together, we predicted the relationships independent of the objects, directly from the image features. So our decomposition of this problem is a direct consequence of Biederman's conclusions that the human visual processing system it processes relationships in parallel to objects. And now similarly, our model also processes relationships independent of the objects using a separate approach. Um, now, but aside from this cognitive grounding, this decomposition also alleviates our long tail problem because even if a person standing on a horse occurs infrequently in our data set, um, the object detectors will now have seen enough examples of people and enough examples of horses um, where they can now identify these individual objects with some amount of certainty. And similarly, a relationship detector will have also seen enough examples of things standing on other things to also be able to identify that relationship uh, with more certainty. And once the relationship and objects are predicted independently, we can combine these individual predictions using just a simple cross product to produce the n squared times k number of predictions that we want. But now we're doing it by just requiring our model to make n plus k number of output um, predictions. So with this new formulation, with the decomposition of this visual processing into its separate object and relationship branches, uh, this allows our models to now generalize to novel compositions. Uh, for example, by looking at examples of people riding horses and instances of people wearing hats, our model can now um, generalize to predict when horses are wearing a hat, a composition that is completely absent from its training data. Similarly, by looking at examples of people sitting on a chair, uh, and examples of fire hydrants on a ground, our model can now also identify when a person is sitting on a fire hydrant. Again, something it's never seen before, but by understanding and recognizing these individual components, it's able to generalize a lot, lot better. Now, this model was able to improve mean average precision points uh, by detecting novel compositions by about three times as compared to a variant uh, that used object features to learn these relationships. And while this result was encouraging, we wanted to see if we could increase performance further. So we began analyzing what were the common sources of error or common types of error that our model was making. And we found one type of error that kept on appearing. So to explain this error, let's consider this image. Our model looks at this picture and predicts that both people are throwing the frisbee. It doesn't really have any sort of higher order reasoning capability that rationalizes that if one person is throwing a frisbee, that a second person can't possibly be throwing the same frisbee. Instead, the second person is probably trying to reach for the frisbee or trying to catch it. And this error occurs because each relationship prediction is done completely in a feed-forward manner. The model doesn't really reevaluate each prediction by placing it in context with all the other predictions that it's making. Um, now, again, in contrast, we know that the human visual processing system is abundant with these sort of feedback connections where uh, they share information, are able to make more coherent, cohesive predictions, and even correct these incorrect assumptions um, automatically. So can we also improve our model by thinking about using a similar kind of feedback-like mechanism? 
So in order to build in these kinds of higher order reasoning, we extended this original model that we proposed with a new graph convolutional layer. Uh, in our work, we extended the traditional graph convolution for, uh, formulation to operate over three-dimensional uh, visual representations and over two special kinds of nodes, object nodes and relationship nodes. Now, um, uh, the object nodes, they learn a function which is parameterized by a small convolutional neural network that learns to pass messages from the relationships nodes that it's connected to. And similarly, the relationship nodes, they incorporate information from the two object nodes that it's connected to. And by iteratively updating both the object and the relationship nodes, we can effectively pass information through the entire graph. And hopefully uh, this would allow the models to then make a more cohesive prediction at the end where now it knows all the other uh, predictions that it's making to make one correct prediction and fix any incorrect assumptions. And with this graph convolution layer, we are actually able to add on five more average mean average precision points, which is very encouraging, meaning that adding in this sort of higher order reasoning capability was really useful in being able to generate better um, scene graphs from images. But aside from the quantitative improvements, modeling these relationships as um, these message passing functions between objects, it also allows us to develop a, what, what I like to think of as the sort of contextual object representation. Uh, so just like contextual word embeddings in natural language processing affords arithmetic operations um, between different words, our contextualized object representations also allow us to now perform operations but these operations are now defined by relationships. For example, um, when we apply the eating relationship function to the people cluster, um, we can change and modify those, uh, those representations of people to more food-like representations like pizza, ice cream, noodles, et cetera. And uh, we find that these uh, contextual object representations provide the sort of necessary structure to really afford learning new relationships very quickly with sometimes as few as one training example. So for example, just with one instance of a person picking up uh, something. So for example, uh, a man picking up a burger, this allows the model to learn very quickly that if a man can pick up a burger, then women and children can also pick up other food items. Uh, and it learns that because you've got this contextualized representation already built in for all of your objects, so learning new relationships can draw on all the other um, groupings that are also possible with those same relationships. So graph convolutions are of course, just one of many potential frameworks that you can use to produce these higher order uh, types of reasoning over relationships uh, within an image. Uh, and the computer vision community has really built upon our original framework to develop hundreds of scene graph models uh, today. Uh, these methods, they, they incorporate ideas from uh, numerous fields, uh, with techniques ranging from uh, message passing, reinforcement learning, to recently just a lot of transformer-based scene graph generation models. Uh, but across the board, one thing has really remained consistent across all of these models, and that's the original decomposition uh, that we introduced, which was inspired by Biedermann. The only thing that's really changed across these hundreds of models is how we design these feedback connections. Okay. Next, um, let me talk a little bit briefly about how we can utilize scene graphs to train downstream tasks with as few as five training examples. So downstream tasks like action detection, they are extremely data hungry. Uh, they have to find meaningful signal in uh, videos that contain hundreds of frames. And the actions that we're trying to detect often take up only a few frames within um, that entire session. Um, and and uh, if you just try to detect these things from just raw pixels, it's a very, very sparse uh, data problem because only a few of those pixels are only going to be helpful for you to detect these actions. Now, instead, if you had a scene graph model, you could represent each frame in the video as a scene graph instead of a, a dense representation. So now any sort of downstream action recognition task can detect actions by reasoning over the changes in relationships between these different objects instead of reasoning over the raw pixel values. So it can learn the action uh, waking up in bed, which results from a change in relationship between the person and their bed from initially lying on the bed to finally sitting on it. 
And with just five to 10 training examples, we showed that we can increase um, mean average precision by pre-training on scene graphs instead of pre-training on, um, on, on just the, the directly end-to-end -end learning the task. So finally, let me tell you a little bit about how some of our recent work um, utilizes scene graphs to test how vision models are really capable of uh, understanding compositional spatial temporal understanding. So one of the main tasks through which we measure compositional understanding today in the vision community is through a question answering setup. In the setup, a model is presented with a video and a corresponding natural language question and is tasked with generating an answer uh, to that question about the video. And over the years, many benchmarks have been proposed. And it appears, if you look closely, that the models have been getting better and better every single year. Because the numbers and performance on a lot of these benchmarks are really improving quite rapidly. But the question is, even if these improvements are happening, are they happening because models are getting better at recognizing objects? Are they getting better at recognizing relationships? Are they getting better at understanding actions or other temporal events? Or are they improving their ability to reason over the compositions of all of these individual things? Uh, now, unfortunately, we haven't actually been tested this. We haven't been able to do any sort of analysis uh, using these benchmarks because most of the benchmarks that exist today, they don't really provide any sort of fine grade categorization of when and why these models fail. And provide such uh, fine grade categorization, we'd have to know exactly what kind of reasoning, compositional, uh, compositional reasoning that our models need to do to be able to answer uh, any given specific question. So to enable this kind of inspection and to allow us to directly measure this sort of compositional reasoning of capability, we introduced a new benchmark called AGQA, which is directly built upon the scene graphs uh, in videos uh, in the action genome uh, data set. So AGQA, this, this new benchmark that we're introducing, is about three orders of magnitude larger than any of the previous benchmarks that have been introduced so far. It contains about 192 million question answers for about 10,000 videos. And it also contains a more balanced data set uh, to evaluate how well these models are performing. And this balanced data set contains about 4 million question answer pairs. Now, uh, to give you an example of the kinds of questions that it has, for example, we can now explicitly measure how well models perform in reasoning over very specific types of questions. We can isolate performance on questions that require a model to locate an object, for example. So the question, what did the person hold after putting a phone somewhere? This is a question that's requiring the person to classify and identify a specific object. Uh, similarly, other questions ask the model to reason over actions like holding a bottle, and uh, some ask it to reason over the temporal ordering of events, like using the words before or after to describe what happened when. So by explicitly annotating every single question with these different reasoning capabilities that our models need to exhibit, we can now test whether models are really improving at specific things like objects or relationships or compositional understanding more generally. So to build AGQA, um, the way we did it is we took each video and we sampled frames from that video. And then the next thing we did was um, we annotated each one of those frames with the actions uh, that are taking place in them. Some actor, a person was performing some actions within those frames, we annotated them. Um, and then we annotated the objects that the person interacted with while performing those actions, and then their corresponding relationships with those objects to describe how those relationships are changing as that action is taking place. And of course, um, aside from just annotating all the relationships, we also created a variety of entailment rules to propagate uh, the, the sort of um, scene graphs that we annotated for one image across all the fr neighboring frames to make sure we had a dense representation of all the things that were happening in a given video. And we did all of this using um, uh, online uh, crowd workers that came in and actually generated all of the scene graphs. Now, once we had those scene graphs, we built dozens of question templates for example, this question here asks if a person does a specific relationship on an object during a specified time period. And to answer this template, we curated a program uh, associated with every single template. 
In this case, this program iterates over a specific time period, and then it finds the list of frames where a person performs a specific relationship with any object. And then finally, we filter through that list that's produced to find the specific object that's mentioned in the question. And so every single question template comes associated with a specific program that helps us find the answer uh, to the question. And now we can combine these question templates that we generated uh, from with the scene graphs that we have annotated. And by combining the two, we can now produce questions. Uh, for example, did they watch a phone before lying down? Um, to generate a question like this or to answer uh, this question with a ground truth answer, uh, we can now use the program that we have to iterate over the time period before they were performing the action of just lying down. And it finds all the objects that the person was looking at or watching, uh, which is the word used in our data set. Uh, it was uh, to find all the objects that the person was looking at uh, in, in all the frames before performing that action. And then finally, we look to see if phone exists within that list. And in this case, um, if you look at the, the little GIF that's playing on the left-hand side, you'll notice that the person doesn't actually look at their phone before lying down. They only look at it after lying down. So the answer to this question is no. So for, uh, for these 10,000 images that we had, we ended up generating about 192 million questions and answer pairs. But of course, some questions are naturally just a lot more common than others because people like to perform specific kinds of interactions a lot more uh, than others. So to make this entire data set more uh, malleable to study exactly how um, diverse these compositional skills are, uh, we smooth our answer distributions to curate a balanced data set of about 4 million. So our unbalanced data set is about 192, whereas a balanced one that is more balanced across uh, all the di different kinds of questions that we could ask is about 4 million. We validated the entire correctness of this entire uh, generation process using two human studies. Uh, and similar to other data sets like GQA and Clever, our data set setup was also um, uh, correct to about 70 to 80% accuracy, 85% accuracy. And the errors that we found in this generation process, they came from errors that originated in the, the, the annotations in the scene graphs or from mismatches between the ontology and how people typically define categories and from the cognitive load of actually doing the studies themselves, because we have a large number of categories of objects and relationships that people need to choose between, and it sometimes is cognitively pretty difficult to do uh, the task correctly. So because of these different kinds of errors, uh, our uh, human accuracy ranged. So we evaluated uh, three state-of-the-art models on this entire benchmark and found that surprisingly, they, uh, they performed much, much worse uh, than we expected. In fact, um, the, the, most, uh, the best performing model that we had out of uh, a model that was proposed earlier in 2020, uh, that model performed only about 47% accurate, uh, whereas human performance, like I mentioned, is somewhere around 86%. So there's quite a large room or gap for these models to really improve uh, performance by quite a large uh, margin. But more surprisingly, we found uh, that even the best model uh, performs about the same uh, if you prevented it from seeing the video. So for example, if we passed in no video at all and only passed the questions, we found that the drop in accuracy was very minimal. And this seems to suggest that these improvements that we're seeing or these numbers that we're seeing are really just because of the linguistic biases that exist in their questions and not because these models are actually improving at understanding these compositional video events and reasoning over them. We also divided our data set into multiple test sets to really try to answer what are the different kinds of capabilities that our models are capable of answering. Uh, for example, one test set uh, studies whether uh, our models can answer superlative questions that's, that ask about events that happened at the beginning, all the way to the first or at, uh, the last event that happened. Uh, duration test set tests how well models are able to keep track of time and measure what takes longer than uh, some other thing. And activity recognition types of questions in our data set, they measure um, how well our models are able to recognize specific kinds of activities uh, within um, the different videos.
And what we found is that performance across all these different categories, it really varied quite widely. And there was not a single model that outperformed all the others across all these different capabilities. Now, there's a bunch of in individual details and uh, analyses that we go through in our paper. So uh, check that out. I won't have time to go over them today. Uh, but I do want to sort of mention that we introduced three new compositionality metrics along with this paper in, uh, in this AGQA benchmark. And one of those metrics explicitly tests whether models are able to generalize to novel compositions. For example, a novel composition is combining any two discrete ideas, like uh, the idea of combining uh, the concept, the temporal concept of before uh, with the relationship standing up. So in a question, for example, uh, like what did they take before standing up? Now this question asks our model to recognize not just um, standing up, but also reason over before and understand that we're looking for things before that specific um, activity or relationship. And uh, to ensure that these compositions are novel in our test set, we included these individual ideas in our training set, but we included them with other kinds of uh, combinations. So the word before was always followed by other kinds of actions like washing a dish or lying down, but never with standing up. And similarly, standing up was always preceded by other kinds of compositions like while or after, but never with a temporal word before. And what we found, again, was that models are really terrible at being able to um, generalize these novel compositions. Binary questions where the random chance of guessing correctly is about 50%. We found that our best models perform only about 52%. And for open answer questions, which have uh, quite a lot of cap potential categories as answers, in that category, models only perform about 23%. So quite a lot of improvement still left to be done to be able to recognize and generalize these novel compositions. And finally, we found that the question complexity, uh, as it increases by requiring more compositional reasoning steps, it results in the models performing worse. So model performance decreases as the number of compositional steps increases. Uh, and in comparison, humans do not decrease in their ability to perform uh, or answer these questions as the compositional steps increase. So we hope this, that this benchmark will allow researchers to build and test better compositional models in the future. And then currently, uh, this is some unpublished work. We're currently playing around with the idea of compositional consistency, um, where we're trying to find uh, and generate sub-questions for every single compositional question in our benchmark. Um, and these sub-questions are questions that our model should be able to answer if it can answer the main compositional question. So we have a way to now take any similar question, break it up into its individual com uh, compositional parts, and then allow us to sort of measure consistency as a, an evaluation measure, but also to use consistency as another surrogate um, uh, loss to uh, add more supervision to our models, to allow it to more generally represent compositions uh, across the entire data set. Okay, so with that, let me sort of end today by briefly showcasing some example downstream applications that uh, we have explored with scene graphs and how the vision community has been using them. Um, so aside from action recognition and compositional question answering, we've also been utilizing scene graphs as a, a, an intermediate representation that connects language with vision. And this allows us to decompose these long language queries into scene graphs so we can bottle uh, all of these long question, uh, queries into these individual discrete representations. And then finally, we can do complex image retrieval by searching using these scene graphs that we've extracted from language. Other people in the vision community has also similarly used scene graphs to improve image captioning by including an intermediate scene graph representation bottleneck in the middle as we transform images uh, into text. Others have also improved visual question answering by explicitly extracting scene graphs from these images, uh, as I'm showing in the top left part of the figure, and by encoding these relationships as these sort of knowledge facts about the image. So now models can not only uh, reason over the pixel values, but also reason over this database of extracted relationships uh, to answer any given question. And recently, there's been some amount of work on using scene graphs to specify and generate entirely new images by thinking about the entire generation process as this compositional process of combining individual objects and relationships to generate novel kinds of images. So the community really has been utilizing scene graphs for a variety of tasks. And as I mentioned, image generation from text is becoming one of those bigger uh, use cases. But aside from that, there's also a lot of work uh, being done in understanding 3D 
um, uh, and on, uh, navigating around the world by using these scene graphs as a prior to explain what kinds of objects are perhaps near one another. In question answering, uh, reasoning is currently being done explicitly by extracting scene graphs from those uh, images and then answering questions on top of it. And similarly, we also uh, uh, introduced a uh, benchmark, like I mentioned, where now we have extracted scene graphs from videos and not just from images. And then in HCI, a lot of folks are using scene graphs as a way to build interactive storytelling tools um, where you can generate sketches by combining different strokes uh, generated by different components of a scene graph. So to wrap up, um, what I've really talked about today is uh, scene graphs, which are this sort of representation that's grounded in human cognition and how it can be used to design compositional models that can recognize novel compositions of these previously seen concepts. And then finally, we touched upon how they can be used for downstream applications and also how they can be used for compositional spatial temporal reasoning. Okay, so with that, thank you. Let me take some questions. Thank you. Yes. Go ahead, Anju. Sorry. Hi, Anju. Cool data set. Hey, Anju. Hi. Um, uh, I was wondering where is the how, where is what's the source of the video from the picture one of the video that you were showing with the man cleaning. It seemed like the Interc workers are like capturing their own data. Or yeah, yeah, that's a good question. We actually built on top of the charades data set. Um, charades data set, as you uh, might already know, it, it asked Interc workers to. Uh, record themselves doing particular kinds of tasks. Um, we built on top of that data set by annotating uh, it with all the objects and relationships that they engage on, engage with. Right, right, right. And then I, I guess I'm not too familiar, but like, what are the like? It's so interesting these models that these models don't really work well. No, I'm not too surprised. Yeah. But like, yeah. are they trained on charades like domain? Like you know, like the. The visual quality kind of looks very different in my, like, you know, charades look very different from like other videos. So I was wondering yeah. Yeah, if it's trained on that kind of video. Yeah, that's also a good question. The way we sort of pre train these things, uh, we follow the same sort of mechanism that most other vi uh, video question answering models typically do. Uh, there's a component that captures just static scene in, uh, features that are pre trained initially on ImageNet. There's some that are pre trained on data sets like Ava uh, to capture more motion like features. And then they're fine tuned on the specific data set that we care about. In this case, it would be charades to so understand those actions. And then finally, there, those features are used to train these question answering type of uh, tasks. So it's uh, multiple stages of pre-training. So there is some amount of fine tuning that does happen and it should allow these models to generalize. We have seen that this process does work well for other kinds of benchmarks uh, like TVQA um, and I think it was another one called um, movie something, um, but it doesn't seem to work well for charades. But yes, you're right. There, there, there are of course differences in the kinds of um, visual content in uh, all of these different data sets. So that might also be playing quite a role uh, as well in how well these models actually perform. Cool, great, thanks. Very good. Uh, thank you, Ranjai. Great presentation as always. Uh, uh, quick question I actually wanted to ask too. Um, uh, with, with the trend, the research trend over the past two, three years that everything's going too unsupervised. <laughs> uh, uh, what do you think how, uh, about the, the direction of like this dense uh, type of supervision that comes from scene graphs, compositionality in general? And uh, uh, gener I, I know uh, the, the visual uh, question answering uh, part that you, that you presented, it, 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 it mined the questions. So it, it somehow created the supervision that the networks require. But, but in general, how, how does field uh, you, you think may look like in, in a couple of years, uh, given all of these uh, GPT style uh, unsupervised, self-supervised foundation model type of uh, uh, methods? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So there's, uh, I have a few thoughts on this. First of all, of course, I think it's pretty encouraging that you don't need a lot of the supervision to be able to build really good models. And it's great that we can just mine a lot of data from the internet and be able to generate models to perform a variety of different tasks. But that being said, a lot of these sort of improvements that we're seeing are only possible when you have a lot of data 
in a specific domain. In cases where you don't have a lot of data uh, in more specialized fields or for fine grade recognition or other kinds of things where perhaps data is uh, sparse, in those scenarios, adding in this additional sort of representation that allows these models to quickly sort of generalize to novel things might be a way to sort of allow them to work better in domains like that. Now, um, that's one place where I see a lot of um, this sort of compositional or representational power coming in. Um, so in few shot cases. Now, aside from that, um, there's always going to be this need to be able to explain our models or to be able to generate um, explainability or interpretable models. And uh, for specific kinds of use cases down the line, I'm sure I can envision cases where we do need this sort of explicit representation to be able to gain approval or trust from users to be able to reason about what these models are really doing. Um, so in those cases, again, I see benefit in being able to use these sort of representations to be able to generate um, applications that people actually want to use and trust. Um, and then finally, um, I, I think there's also just uh, a lot of, um, you know, uh, GPT is great, um, Clip is great, but again, Clip also doesn't really do well with a lot of compositional reasoning. So it, it seems like we're not there yet with, uh, with these kinds of things. Um, so uh, another sort of unexplored area is what if you combine all of this sort of composition with the kinds of pre-training methods that are out there and perhaps you can do something even better. Um, so it'd be nice to see self-supervised compositional models uh, somehow take the stage at some point in the near future. Thank you. Yes, nice. Andrew, you still have your hand up. Yeah, yeah. I have another follow-up question. I think that would be super cool. Um, well, um, yeah, that seems like uh, something that will come up in the horizon, actually, especially with your data set, right? Like, I couldn't you? I guess it's hey, difficult yeah, to read that data. Well, so my question is kind of like, what are your thoughts on, like, the quality of the data or, like, you know, some those data sources like TV shows or movies. I know, I guess you were looking at Ava, but like, you know, um, that kind of TV shows or films are like, has more storylines. And like, um, I really do like the idea of charades, but also like, not that many people do interesting things in front of the camera, you know what I mean? And when they do it, is that it does it look really like the distribution of all the other videos where people are actually doing that and being filmed, you know? I mean, TV yeah. show also has its own bias, but like, yeah, what do you think about this, you know, the source of data and like, what would be your ideal kind of, you know, to study this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um... The quick question is, uh, the quick answer is, uh, it, it really depends on the applications that we're going after, right? Uh, so there, there's quite a lot of push, it seems like, coming out of Facebook, trying to understand uh, ego-centric data, for example, right now. Um, so for to enable applications there, I think we just need more data coming in that are captured from a first-person point of view. If we want applications that are more, um, you know, uh, aim towards helping uh, people in old age homes and we need to have completely different kinds of surveillance uh, or monitoring kind of systems for these homes um, and data sets from that source. It, it really depends on the application. Um, of course, you're completely right that charades is probably not going to be uh, the data source that's going to get us there. Uh, but the reason we chose it is because it has a nice sort of um, distribution of all possible actions that people perform in the data set because they were asked to perform those actions. Uh, and usually in the real world, what you typically have is particular actions that are just overwhelm, overwhelmingly present and everything else just barely present at all. Uh, and we really focus on that data set as a way to measure progress more than a, re a rendering new kinds of applications. But we hope that the lessons that do come out of improving on these benchmarks can later on be sort of transferred to other sources where it can improve. Um, now, uh, the other part of your question was uh, the quality of the data itself. You know, ideally, I really wish that we didn't need to annotate any of these data sets. It'd be nice if we had automatic methods that could extract these individual components or compositions uh, from data that already exists. And who knows, perhaps we actually can, but we just haven't done any sort of experiments, or at least I haven't seen any experiments where people have run a parser on all these large curated data sets that people are collecting and then just pre-trained on that. Perhaps we already have all the data we need, we just haven't used it. So again, another thing that I expect we'll see pretty soon in the next couple of years. Cool, thanks.